Hi everybody, so it's the uh, June 2022 Bay Area Herpetological Society monthly meeting and we're really lucky to, to have for our speaker tonight Brian Villamono, is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, more or less. Uh, more or less, so I pronounced <laughs> it right. Anyway, um, so he drove, big hand for him, he drove all the way from Novato here and he brought some of his boas and he breeds locality, special locality boas and he, be sure to check out his YouTube channel um, well, and if you see this, you might be on YouTube, but um, I enjoy watching him. He's usually holding a snake, and um, when he talks, and as a personal aside, I've noticed, because I have a backyard, I have a long, couple long hoses, and I don't even, they're so long, I don't have a thing to put them in. I just gather them, but they get tangled. I've noticed that I'm, I've gotten a secondary skill of just trusting the force, so to speak, and unraveling hoses from handling snakes. So without further ado, here's Brian. Great, thanks so much, Jeff, for the intro, and thanks for inviting me out to speak. Thank all you guys for coming out, I really appreciate it. So, um, I'm, one of my favorite topics, of course, is boa constrictors, so I'm always uh, jump at the chance to talk about them to you know anyone who wants to listen, since I spend so much of my time and energy devoted to my boas. So I've been into reptiles about 40 years, so most of my life, and for the first 20 years or so I kept a variety of different lizards and snakes and, tur and turtles. Um, but about 20 years ago I decided just to focus specifically on one type of animal, which of course is the boa constrictor. And um, you know, today I, I want to share with you guys why I like boas so much and why I think they're so rewarding to work with. Let me just grab my... Uh, my laser pointer, which is also a uh, temperature gun for my snakes. <laughs> um, so what I'm gonna do is give a kind of a broad overview of a lot of topics in BOAS. I'm not gonna go real deep in any topic, but if you wanna hear more about anything, you know, uh, um, once I finish the slides and we can get off the animals, I'll be happy to you know, talk to you for however long. I think we have the room till like 10, uh, and then we'll probably get kicked out, but um, happy to stay and talk to anybody. But um, I'm going to start off by just defining what boa constrictors are and why they're such great animals to work with. I'm going to talk about some of the different types of boas that are out there, both the locality specific and the morph boas, which are kind of the two sides of the hobby. We'll talk about how to take care of boas. Um, and then I'm going to talk about breeding boas based on, you know, things I've learned over the last few years, you know, trying to breed them myself. And um, it's, I'm constantly learning new stuff, just, you know, trying to breed the boas. So it's, um, always a work in progress. But at the end I've brought some of my animals so we can take out a few of my boas and you know check them out and you can see some of the you know, really cool boas that are, uh, are out there. So first off what is a boa constrictor? So um, boas are a medium to large snake that occupies a huge range in the Americas. You can see all the way from Mexico down throughout Central America and most of South America. And until recently, it was classified as a single species boa constrictor, which is the same as the common name, so it's easy uh, scientific name to remember. But you know, within the greater uh, family Boidae, we have other types of boas, like rainbow boas, rubber boas, anacondas, etc. Um, but you know, the, when, I, when I say boa in this talk, I'm going to be specifically referring to a snake in the boa constrictor group, not uh, you know any kind of boa like that. But um, up until a few years ago, it was just the one species, and there were something like eight to 10 subspecies, depending on what you believed. But there was a study that came out um, about six years ago by Darren Carr et al., and they used a DNA evaluation to sequence uh, DNA from boas from all over the range. And um, this is actually the graphical abstract, so it kind of shows you their techniques here. And I highly recommend you check out the paper. It's available online. So definitely worth reading. But they had um, skin samples from boas from Mexico through Central America and South America, as well as the outlying islands of Central America. And they used mitochondrial and, and nuclear DNA analysis to group them into related groups. And this is kind of you know, the schematic of you know, what they did. But they found that the DNA sequences clustered into three different groups. Okay, so you had one group of animals that came from the western coast of Mexico. You had another group of animals that came from southern Mexico and Central America. And then the third group clustered together was uh, animals from South America. And they proposed, based on this DNA uh, sequence analysis, 
that the boas be reclassified as three separate species. So there's species boa sigma in uh, western Mexico, the species boa imperator in southern Mexico and Central America, and that was formerly known as the subspecies boa constrictor imperator. And then we have the species boa constrictor, which encompasses much of South America. And there are still several subspecies out there, a boa constrictor and also a boa imperator. In some cases, it's not really well defined whether these subspecies fall under boa constrictor or boa imperator. Um, so you know, we, we have to just stay tuned to see uh, how the science evolves. So boas, uh, one of the, the most common misunderstandings about boa constrictors is that they're, is that they're giant snakes. And I would say they're not really giant snakes at all. I would call them medium to large snakes. So um, adult boas are typically anywhere from 3 to 10 feet in length. The absolute maximum is probably around 14 feet. But this is, you know, extremely rare. And humans can get up to like 8.5 feet too, but you don't see someone that tall very often. So most of the adult boas, um, other than the, the dwarf forms, are somewhere in the 6 to 8 foot range. And then there are dwarf forms which max out at you know, about three and a half to about five and a half feet. So definitely not giants. I think a lot of people are put off from boas because they think they're these huge unmanageable snakes, but that's really not true at all. Incidentally, there is a statistic often quoted that the maximum is 18 feet for a boa constrictor, but that was an erroneous um, report. It was actually an anaconda that was in that report. So even though that's been debunked, you see, I still see that statistic all over the place, and people will quote it all the time, but it's really not true. So boas, of course, are muscular snakes being constrictors, and typically they have a kind of a lighter background color. They have these darker markings along, along the back, and these markings are known as saddles, and the saddles can be different shapes. Um, the saddles typically will form into kind of blotches as they get closer to the tail, and many have a kind of bright red blotches as the tail, and these are called red tail boas. The head is kind of triangular shaped and flattened. They typically have these vertical pupils, and they, really, they um, often have really beautiful head markings. Um, boas are one of the most primitive types of snakes, and they retain the vestiges of the limbs from the ancestor that evolved into snakes. And boas, especially the males, have these little claws on either side of the cloaca. And they actually will use these to court the female. Um, and they actually, it's the remains of you know, what was once the legs in the ancestor of the boa. Okay, so boas are generalists, and that's why they've been so successful. They can do well in a lot, large variety of different environments. They can eat a lot of different types of food. People think about boas living in the Amazon rainforest, but they're equally at home in mountains, in grasslands, um, semi-desert, even desert. So um, what's kind of interesting with boas is there's these island forms that are from South Central America. And there are a lot of islands in Central America, and many of them have a boa that has made it there at some point in the past. And they've typically evolved into smaller forms because there's less food there. So there's a lot of evolutionary pressure on them to evolve into these small sizes that don't need much food. And this is a, called a crawl key boa, which is it's from a small island off the coast of Belize. And these guys get to be about four to five feet in length. Um, Boas in the wild typically are ambush predators. They don't really move around a whole lot. They just kind of sit there waiting for a food item to come. And they're not really picky as far as eating. You know, so most of the diet is warm-blooded prey, things like uh, rodents and other mammals and birds. But they'll also eat reptiles uh, and amphibians as well. So looking at the range of the different boas, as I mentioned, is this really huge range probably um, you know, well over a million square miles. Incidentally, I believe this map is a little erroneous. You know, I actually just found it on, on a Wikipedia or a uh, Google search. Uh, as far as I know, boas don't get into Uruguay or this far south in South America. They probably get to about here. Um, and they also, um, yeah, so just a, a disclaimer there. But as we mentioned, boa sigma is the species from western Mexico. Uh, boa imperator known as the common boa from Central America down through um, 
or southern Mexico, Central America, down into western Colombia. And incidentally, the Andes Mountains are the boundary between Boa Imperator and Boa Constrictor. So it serves to isolate the genes, so those two populations don't mix very much. And then we have Boa Constrictor on the uh, eastern side of the Andes Mountains. There's also some feral populations in South Florida, including at least one that's actually breeding. And these animals are, um, it's a relatively small population. It's actually on a nature preserve. And there's only probably a few dozen of the boas there, but they are actually reproducing and they've been breeding uh, for at least a few decades. And um, hopefully they'll continue. Hopefully no one will you know, think they need to be wiped out because they're you know, invasive, non-natural species. These animals do not pose nearly the threat as like, the Burmese pythons do in South Florida. Uh, as far as I know, there's no breeding populations in California or any other states, but um, every so often, you know, boas do escape their common pets, so it might be possible that you could encounter one in the wild, unfortunately, if uh, someone lets their pet get out. Okay, so what is so great about working with boas? Well, one of the things that really attracts me to them is the huge range of diversity and different types of boas that are out there. And the boa hobby really has two sides to it. So there's a locality specific side. So these are people who collect and breed boas that descend from animals collected from a specific location. And they want to keep their breeding projects pure. You know, if they have a boa from one location, they don't want to introduce any boas that aren't from that location. And you know, what defines a location is you know, uh, often somewhat uh, open to debate, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But then there's also the morph specific, or the morph breeders. And so these, as you probably know, are people that look for mutations and color and pattern that pop up randomly. And they breed them together to make these designer boas, which are kind of like living works of art. So, you know, the first one was, of course, the albino. This is just an albino, a call albino boa. Um, this is a, a Suriname locality boa, Suriname reptile locality boa. But, um, as I mentioned, boas don't really get that big, and if you've kept a ball python or corn snake and you feel comfortable doing that, there's a boa in that size range as well. Hey guys, thanks for watching the video up to this point. This is the point of the presentation where the camera unfortunately decided to stop filming. And I was about 10 feet away, so I didn't realize it had stopped filming around 12 minutes in. and. Uh, I've never seen it do this before, not quite sure what happened, but unfortunately I didn't record the rest of the presentation and you know, missed out on a lot of uh, interesting questions and discussion. Because this happened, I think I'm going to make a video of all the slides from the presentation with some more streamlined narrative and you know, maybe some B-roll of some of my snakes or something like that. So hopefully I can encapsulate all of the material from this lecture into a somewhat enjoyable YouTube video for the future. And I think it'll be a great start for people that are just getting into boas to you know, get a taste of what's out there. So until then, be well and enjoy your boas.